thank you for uh, now with all the technical teams around the globe. My name is David Olutilunya. I'm a neurosurgeon in Nairobi, Kenya. I work with Mahmoud Qureshi. And uh, we thought I'd just share some thoughts about endoscopic third ventriculostomy and some of the techniques in terms of avoidance of complications. I thought I'd put Ben Wolf there because he's one who's done most work really in terms of endoscopic third ventriculostomy. He was using a pediatric cystoscope and it was a flexible one. Kenya is right next to Uganda, so it's part of our claim to fame. I started doing endoscopy here before 2006 using a pediatric cystoscope, which was from Carl Storrs. It was the only rigid scope that we had available, and I had borrowed some Fogarty Boon balloon catheters. I started using a forceps, bronchoscopy forceps, to do ETVs, and I thought I was being clever, but Philippe Deck actually published this in the as a case report and technical notes in 2000. So after that, it was accepted that this was a way forward. Now, in Kenya, we had a watershed year in, in 2006, because a group of us went to the IFNE in Lyon, France. We met Jose Piquet and Shizuo Oi. There we see Jose Piquet with one of the first courses we had here. We used the OI endoscope, and you can see how, in terms of utilizing it, some of the things that we worry about is the freehanded technique, it has to be stable. Now, there are two, there are actually three neurosurgeons who are watching Jose Piquet to stabilize it. We were told earlier how we use a sheath. And it's important that as it is like a gun, you secure it next to your body so it does not overshoot. The first endoscopes, endoscopy was done. Three neurosurgeons. There's Mulunga there, work with Jose Piquer with the Shizoi Oi endoscope. It has been secured, not a freehanded technique. And with that, Jose is gripping it close to his chest. They're all looking at the tower. And that's one of the techniques to make sure that you do not overshoot. Mahmoud Qureshi doing the same. Same thing, somebody securing it on the table. As he had mentioned earlier, we have excessively large hydrocephalus. Shizuo Oi called it mega hydrocephalus. And you can see on the patient's head, it is actually trans illuminating because there's so much fluid within it. In terms of the techniques, the irrigating, irrigating tubes that we have, light source, we were shown about the use of towers, but we used the telepack system. Telepack, it has all in one, the screen, the light source, and there's the OI endoscope, like a gun. And we said that this is like the 007. So this telepack system, travel around the region, and uh, it has been published in neurosurgery, world neurosurgery. Both Mahmoud Qureshi and Jose Piquet have published that. The usefulness of it, it's portable, and you do not need the maximum tower for it to be able to work. This fits in a suitcase, and for our setup in this region, it is very useful. What I will do now, I think you had the anatomy shown earlier on by Mahmoud Qureshi. This is an example of 
using the shizu oil, we went through the sheath, entering form of Monroe. As I told you earlier, in our setup, we sometimes have very thick flow of the third ventricle. This one is not too bad. You can see the infundibulum of the pituitary. And that's the flow of the third. The mammillary bodies are there, widened. And in this particular, you can actually see the pulsation of the flow of the third ventricle. Now the technique that I was shown earlier, straight down holding it next to your body, the free-handed technique is what you utilize. And for the patient's heads, we sometimes just secure them using simple tape, the 3M tape, so that the head does not move around much. In this particular, demonstration, we'll be using a Fogarty catheter. Now the Fogarty catheter that we have can fit through the working channel. If it is too firm, it would not be able to go through. There is no, we don't use an, an introducer in this, going through. And then you use balloon it out. It was mentioned how you have to make sure you go below, beyond the liliquous membranes, both arms, that the cephalic branch, balloon goes up. And at this point, that is being done by your assistant. And while you stay still, you widen it through. It is not as quick as what some of the experts have done, but this is with our experience here slowly. Try and make sure that you get to the waist of it. And all this time we're getting irrigation going. We try to widen that a bit more. Just advance that. And once that is done, we are able therefore to introduce the scope right through. There are bits of the membrane still there, liquid membrane, but we are able to see the basal artery right there. That's an example using the tube. It is not, we don't widen that anymore, but I think purists would say that's a sheath that we use for the oil endoscope. The next one is using the forceps method. Same route into the foramen of Monroe. You can see the choroid plexus. There is Monroe. And I'll just pause that it is possible, as Mahmoud Qureshi had mentioned earlier, in terms of avoiding damage of the phonics, which is up there. We see the mammillary bodies, the of the third, and there's the, the forceps technique. And I think this is what was mentioned earlier using the lotta, clear. It is rigid, yes. So if, the, if it's quite firm, you'd be able to go through. Advanced. And then it can be widened. You need to have an adequate irrigation system going. Zoomed up, you can see well right through up the base. You can see the basal artery and the pulsations going. And that's what one would like to see. I think it was mentioned earlier that you could go all the way down up to the fourth ventricle through the pipontine system, a big pardon. After doing that, that's how things should be able to work. Now, in terms of avoiding, 
the complications, damage of the neural structures. You really need to know your anatomy, as was mentioned earlier. Get the direction correct for the residents and for people who are not using things for securing it. Not much movement needs to be concerned, secured. For hemorrhage, if you do get little bleeds, you try and make sure that you give a lot of irrigation and majority of the leakage tends to stop. The only problems are if you go through the flow, the third ventricle, and you're unfortunate to have a catastrophic hemorrhage either from the basilar artery or spear cerebella, then that is a tragedy. Infection, we avoid that, the usual cleaning techniques. And as far as CSF leakage is concerned, when you have done the burr hole, what we try and avoid is you do an elliptical excision with only the pericranium, but when you are withdrawing the endoscope, you pack that using the surgery cell along the route. In terms of mobility, if you are too close, sometimes it is possible to affect the pituitary axis. Neurological damage can also occur if you get the phonics and or the surrounding vessels. From the point of view of the techniques, we are lucky here that we've had the OI, the OI endoscope, which we have utilized. This has given us the opportunity to work it throughout the region. In the University of Nairobi, they have a flexible endoscope, which has been utilized also, but that is how we'd be able to take it. Now that picture is of the glacier on Mount Kenya. Because of the work that we did with the Neurological Society of Kenya to be able to get the first rigid OI endoscope to enable us to start on this voyage. I've gone quickly. If you've got questions, comments at this point in time. But whenever you have the uncontrollable bleeding with the irrigation, the first, of course, you have to irrigate a lot of irrigation and a lot of irrigation. But currently, we have the small chamber technique or closed chamber technique and the dry heat technique. These are the new two techniques to control hemorrhage. Of course, I'm not suggesting to use these techniques to control any type of bleeding. You do not have to to say that I will do the dry heat technique to try the technique. No, it's not, uh, it's not the proper way to think about it. But whenever you have uh, uh, some sort of bleeding that is not controlled with irrigation for, uh, let's say, 20 or 30 minutes, you can just uh, step for this dry heat technique, which is uh, you suck the whole CSF and the whole blood, uh, then you sometimes uh, this is enough to control the bleeding and uh, the coagulation process control the bleeding, or the other times which are. Uh, very uh, much more very thanks cut you can just start with the point of bleeding and the dry sector. The other technique is the, the, the closed chamber technique and especially with the system where you have um, the, the, the sheath, the irrigation sheath separable, you can just uh, uh, introduce uh, the, the sheath uh, proximal to the site of bleeding and uh, get the scope out uh, so that you can just compress with the sheath uh, the point of bleeding and then you can uh, just introduce your electric battery to this point of the Okay, these are uh, uh, a little bit advanced techniques. It's not the better to use it in the first or third or maybe the tenth case, but it's better to know these techniques because they are already published and you have to already use them. I think uh, before one goes on to that stage of uh, doing that procedure, the teaching needs to be irrigated, 
irrigate yes. it, irrigate yes. this, irrigate yes. and it grows, etc. Yeah. Uh, so I think only if you notice this despite irrigation, the redness is increasing rather than reducing. That's the final one is some of these and most commonly the either comes from the tumor scenario yeah. and in that situation it's quite effective to reintroduce the fugitive loop and uh, uh, keep it filled up later yeah, inflated and some sort and of then the pressure. three three common P's yeah. patience, pressure and prayer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally yeah. we yeah. yeah. need to stop. So I think with that, uh, unless you have anything else, that's excellent the demonstration of yeah. technique. Yeah, I, I think just, just as a belt and braces, sometimes if you've done all those layers, um, a, a little bit of tissue glue at the end can also help. But, but, <laughs> but by, by, by that time, if it has gone through all the tissue glue, that, that will not hold very much. But yes, as a belt and braces. Yeah. Has the age limit changed? Uh, yeah, it's I think the, the age limit for ETB, as we have proven, six months is really a cutoff. And um, if you do it before, the chance of it working is very slim. So why do it? So I think it's six, it's still six months. Now, there's, there's a slight difference in our thinking. Uh, the thing is that if you look at Ben Wolf's publication, and he did them under six months, even with meningomyosis, we had a 33% success rate. So in our setting, because of the problems with charts, when I go out to do the outreach uh, endoscopy and ETB, I tell the parents, even if it's a month old child, that because of the problems of shunting, and because there is a one in three chance that you will it will be possible that you will get away with without a shunt. I am going to offer you the shunt. And working with our colleague in the in the peripheral hospital, say we will be doing our next mission in about four weeks' time. And if it hasn't worked, then we will have another look. And if the osteum is good, that means there is no adequate absorption. We will proceed to a shunt. So, a, so for, for that reason, I have, uh, come, uh, and it's been published in World of Neurosurgery as well, uh, we tend to offer shunts earlier and earlier. And also, that led us to the discussion on the African Federation of Neurosurgical Grading. Ben Okanga's uh, dissertation, and I'll talk to you publish a bit on that, has shown that the variations are just as important in determining success of ETV. So, the, if you've got a, uh, a grade that has got a lot of multicystic hydrocephalus, has got a lot of scarring, and so even if the child is above uh, two years, it will be a problem. And you're more likely to succeed if you are in the lower grade where your CSF, where your uh, floor, your third ventricle, your walls are all pristine. So those are determinants. So as a result of this combination of our, our trying to promote the uh, African Federation Neurosurgical Grading System and the fact but we've had this uh, publications from Ben Wolf as well, where even with the Ningomyos hills, 33% were successful. We tend to use it as a first line treatment earlier and earlier. Because shunting is good, I think it saved a lot of life. But in our setting, and again, the publication comes from a study at the Napa National Hospital where we had shunt infections and blockages in 33% of the cases. Now, 30, uh, 
3% chunk infection is a huge problem. And in our setting, we seem to have very high rates of infection. Once you get a chunk infection, that child is doomed, and that family is, is in trouble for a long time. So we tend to advocate endoscopic vertebrosomy as a primary procedure, regardless of age, and our results have borne that out, that we do get away in somewhere between 30 to 40 percent in the very young uh, without without the shunt. So why shunt kids can get away? But then the parent must know that they may they may end up having to have a shunt uh, if it doesn't work in about three to four weeks. Now. And what's your experience about the right Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I was trained with Shazu uh, Ahoy, and you should see the way he becomes. When you stood there, when you did that. The moment you say CPC, uh, his blood pressure, his facial expression, all changes. Yeah. And the reason is understandable. CSF is not a water bag uh, for placement into the vessel. It has a function. We are not fully, we do not understand CSF dynamics 100%. There is the, the pathway that goes through the extra uh, ventricular system. It's a recognized pathway. And I believe, and I think Shizuo agrees with that, that that is actually the sewage system of the brain. And you need that CSF to wash away those toxins and the other things that are already uh, harmful metabolites or whatever they are, they are, to wash them away. So it has a function. The only time I would advocate CPC is in a very significantly excessive hydrocephalus, where you're only doing it to assist the mother for nursing. So if you do that and you do a CPC, it's belt and braces, but as a standard cure for obstructive uh, hydrocephalus, I'm not even thinking. Uh, I have used it, but I... How many cases? In my eyes, it is not more than five. Yeah, because uh, I had this an experience, I used it for four cases, and unfortunately I had 50% for that. Yeah, I don't know. There's no explanation. We don't have post-mortem. So, the not more than the And what I find you regarding the cases of hydrogen in cattle. I think that's more from a nursing perspective, yeah. And we have used that in, in uh, one of our regional experts is in Tanzania, uh, uh, Chabani, and he, he does them beautifully. I demonstrate them very well. And I picked the technique from him. I did not go to Benoit, yeah, I picked the technique from him. I have used it in those four or five cases that I mentioned, but I am not uh, a opponent. Favor of the yeah. 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 you know, and even there are uh, some recent studies about the CSF dynamics and circulation against our, uh, our, uh, our solid sort of knowledge. Uh, they are saying that it is in a reverse way. Yeah, yeah. The 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 Emerton studies with the radioactive and this, yeah. So still we don't know the proper CSF dynamics and the proper CSF physiology. There's there's an Italian gentleman who I listen to who is not a neurosurgeon but a researcher on CSF dynamics. Listening to that lecture was convinced, it convinced me that we were on the right line by not pursuing the CTS yeah, line. Exactly. But for those who do it, uh, good luck. Uh, but uh, uh, it's not something that I. Uh, <laughs> I 
Thank you. Yes. Your presentation made a lot of discussions. Yeah. <laughs>